Chapter 3 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. After chapter 3, we're going to go faster, at least till we get to chapter 12. In English, we have two words for the season after summer. We only have one word for winter. We only have one word for spring. We only have one word for summer. But we have two words for the next season. The two words are autumn. Autumn can only mean one thing, and that's a season. And the other word is fall, the fall. That word can mean three or four different things. Well, in English, you know you're beginning to think theologically when you hear someone say the fall and you don't think of a season. You think of Genesis 3. And there are, there are great themes in Scripture that all students of Scripture associate with a certain chapter in the Bible. For instance, if I say 1 Corinthians 13, you say, say it, love. If I say Hebrews 11, you say, faith. Okay. If I say the Beatitudes, you say Matthew 5. If I say the new birth, you say John 3. So, if I say Genesis 3, the Bible student thinks the fall. Or if I say the fall, the Bible student thinks Genesis 3. It's huge. It's huge. Now, I'm going to report to you something that's a little bit blasphemous. But I'm reporting it so that I can say that it's a lie. But it's such a terrible thought that it traumatizes me, it terrifies me even to report it. But since Scripture reports the words of the devil, I will report these words to you. There was a French poet called Charles Baudelaire. He was a 19th century French poet. He was a great hater of Christianity. And this is what Baudelaire said. It's blasphemous and it's a lie, but I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, if God exists, he is the devil. Now, forgive me for even saying that to you. Here's the way Francis Schaeffer asked, answered that question. He said that, or how he responded to that challenge. Francis Schaeffer said, if the world, if God had made the world originally, the way we see the world now, maybe Baudelaire would have an argument. But you see, God did not make the world the way we see it now. God did not make the world with sin and pain and suffering and death. God's original creation was perfect. It was pure and it was upright, and it was something very different from the creation that we see now and the experience that we have now. Now we have another question. It's a question like the question from 2.17. The question from 2.17 is, why did God deposit moral choice in the tree of knowledge? And the other question that we may ask, we could actually ask a lot of questions. Why did God allow sin to exist in the universe, in any universe? But another question is, why did God allow the serpent into the garden? Um, I cannot attempt a full answer to that question. I don't know a full answer to that question. Uh, but I can make a few observations. One observation is this. Um, if we say, why didn't God create a world where there is no sin or suffering? Let me just say that He has created a world like that, and it's called heaven. And, we, and He said, well, why can't humans get to that 
place without sin or suffering? Well, some humans do, and those are infants who die quickly after they're conceived or before they feel any pain. Or, but why didn't God create creatures who could never sin and would only know heaven? God did create creatures like that. They're called angels. So you see, God has created more than one kind of place. And God has created more than one kind of person. And by the way, those are only the persons and the places that we know about. It is true that He has created persons like you and like me who do have moral choices, who do make the wrong choice, who do know sin, who do know suffering, but who also have the possibility of knowing redemption and deliverance. Now again, I don't know why God has allowed this, but I will say this. And, and this may not be a good enough reason to satisfy you, but you've got to understand that God has not made the world to satisfy us. God has made the world to satisfy Himself. Remember what I told you yesterday. Remember the first principle of Theology 101? Remember that? God is God and we are not. So it's important to keep on the right side of the creator-creature divide and to be reverent. Also, if we had absolutely full intellectual answers to all these questions, faith would not be necessary, would it? We wouldn't have to trust, would we? Because we would just know. And if we know completely, then we don't have to trust. But for some reason, it's important to God that we believe Him just on the basis of His Word. And for some reason, it's, impo it's important to God that we trust Him and we exercise faith. So what I'm about to say is this. There are realities in God which could never have, would never have been known without sin. There are qualities in the being of God. There are attributes in the personality of God which would always have been undiscovered if there were not sin and suffering and pain. If there had never been any sin, we would have never known that God had a quality of love to such an extent that He would show grace and mercy because there would be no need for grace or mercy. And if there had never been the suffering which sin leads to, we would never have known that God has a quality of love which was willing to enter the suffering himself and to sacrifice his own son because there would have been, have been no need for God to enter into our suffering and there would have been no need for God to sacrifice his son. And through all eternity we would have only praised God as a creator in terms of his essential attributes, that is his, att his attributes of power and capacity the fact that God can do anything because He's all-powerful, the fact that God knows everything because He's omniscient, the fact that God is present everywhere in the universe. This is what we call God's essential attributes. But we would have never known about God's moral attributes. God's essential attributes are those attributes which make Him God. God's moral attributes are those attributes which make Him a good God. We would never really known about His love and His grace and His mercy and His patience and His forgiveness because there would be no need to know those things. Now when we're faced with death or where we're, when we're faced with suffering, maybe, maybe we're not that encouraged by those truths. But let me say one thing here. If I knew what God knows, and I don't. And if I were good, and I'm not, I would do what God does, and I would allow what God allows. It is true 
that he, he allowed the serpent into the garden. It's also true that the serpent will not be allowed into heaven. And if I knew what God knows, and I don't, and if I were good and I'm not, I would have allowed the same thing. Okay? There's one more little practical application of that reality that I will mention. John Milton, who was a professing Christian, but he was not doctrinally sound, he wrote a, a, a prose work. He's probably the second most famous poet in the English language. He wrote a prose work called Areopagitica. That's taken from the Greek name of Mars Hill in Acts 17, the Areopagus. And if you remember what happened in, in Acts 17, Mars Hill was a place where people would debate the truth. That's where Paul preached his sermon in Athens, in ancient Greece. And what John Milton says in that prose work is he argues against censorship. Censorship is when we say you can't print that, you can't publish that, you can't talk about this, that, or the other. And basically John Milton argues that this is not a good point of view for a Christian. And Milton says, I will not praise, he uses the word cloistered. A cloister is a place where the nuns live. He said, I'll not praise a cloistered virtue. In other words, I'll not praise a virtue which keeps itself uh, behind walls and protects itself. He says, I will not praise a cloistered or a fugitive virtue. A fugitive is somebody who's running away, somebody who's fleeing. So what he's saying is this, a virtue is not a virtue if it has to hide and protect itself. And a virtue is not a virtue if it has to run away. Now let me tell you that I do believe in some forms of censorship, and I don't buy all of Milton's argument. But I will say this, the greatest support for his argument is that the, the fact that God allowed a serpent in the garden even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. You see, I am not a Muslim, and I'm not an atheist, and I'm not a Jew. But I would not want to live in a society where a Jew could not build a synagogue. And I would not want to live in a society where a Muslim could not build a mosque. And I would not want to live in a society where an atheist could not publish his books. Even though the synagogue and the mosque make me sad, and even though the books make me mad, I would not want to live in a society which did not permit those those possibilities. And the reason I say that is because God allowed a serpent into, the, into a perfect paradise. Now, we got to talk about what the serpent was and, and what it means. It says in, in chapter 3, verse 1, that the serpent was more crafty than, than any other beast of the field. And then he said, okay, now right here we, we, we've got to say time out. What on earth does this, this mean that an animal is talking? Well. The unbeliever and the critics, they say, this is, this is the Bible. You know, the Bible is full of fairy tales. The Bible is full of fables. And that's what a fable is. A fable is a story where the animals talk. And these stories in Genesis are like the stories that we learn about in fables, like how the fox got its tail. Um, well, let me just say that the Bible is not a book like that. The Bible is not a book of fables. There are two instances in Scripture where an animal is given a capacity for speech, once by the devil and once by God. And we won't go too deeply into this, but the first thing I want to say is that it's very obvious that the animals had capacities before the fall that they did not have after the fall. I don't know if animals could communicate like humans communicate before the fall? I would say probably not. 
but there, there would be at least one argument that would say that they did have that capacity before the fall, and that argument is as follows. The fact that the serpent spoke to her did not seem to surprise her. It did not seem to shock her. Now, it may be that creation was so young and she was so conscious of the fact that she had not discovered everything in God's creation yet that she just assumed, oh, this is unusual. I didn't know this was possible, but I guess it is possible. So it could be that that's the reason she was not surprised. We can only imagine that there was some cooperation from the animal which allowed the devil to use or the animal would not have been cursed. If the animal was an unwilling partner in the devil's business, then there would have been no reason to curse the serpent. But the fact is, on this one occasion, one of two occasions in Scripture, an animal has a gift of speech, and we may assume that the devil somehow enters the serpent, incarnates himself within the serpent, and speaks through the serpent. Now, chapter 3 is full of spiritual reality. Chapter 3 is full of spiritual lessons for us. And I want to say this in, the, in our last few minutes in this, in this session, and it may surprise you. The devil is not creative. The devil has never created anything. The devil has only imitated God's creation and he's corrupted it. The devil could never paint the Mona Lisa, but the devil could draw a mustache on the Mona Lisa. And the devil does not do many different things. The devil only does four or five different things. But the devil is good at, at disguises and covering up what he does. So, the devil does four or five different things in a thousand different ways. So, you think that he's doing four or five thousand different things, but he's not. He's just doing four or five different things in a thousand different ways. And once we grow and mature as, a, as believers, we can see that that's the devil's work. And we sometimes ask the question when something happens or when something's going on, we say, well, is this from God or from the devil? Well, once we grow a little bit, we can tell. But we also need to understand this, that there's not one cubic centimeter of space in the universe where there's not a battle going on. There's not one cubic centimeter of space in the universe that the devil is not fighting with God over. So in the same reality, the devil can be active and God can be active. And what is a temptation from the devil is an opportunity for obedience to God.